Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. All right, back again. Welcome back to Extension Calling. Man, yeah, it's been a busy week, but uh, good. Yes, yes, it's a uh, uh, fair season, <laughs> at least for our region, is uh, going strong here. Well, um, fair, is, fair is right on top of us right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> the week of Labor Day, so. So it's it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, two different counties, actually, you know, two states, it's the same region and different fairs, but same time period. So the Belmont County Fair and the West Alexander Fair, which is where our 4-Hers show their livestock, um, are at the same time. So Dan and I never get to see each other at the fair. <laughs> no, we don't. Yeah, we don't really get to enjoy our corresponding fairs too much, like... You know, just a little visit, uh, you know, when you don't have too much responsibility and you can enjoy it more and see your colleagues and friends. But um, it's the way it is. And funny thing about a fair schedule is that it never changes. <laughs> never say never, man. That's when things get crazy. <laughs> I, You know what? I think it would take a lot to move a fair date. <laughs> well, yes, the fair date. Yeah, that's never changing. <laughs> so... You, one of the things that uh, we do get to share a lot of is the weather. Um, I can usually find out what my weather is going to be by talking to Dan and <laughs> finding out what he just went through. So we are going to talk a little bit about weather today, um, and namely one particular aspect of weather, which is flooding. Yes, flooding, which is very linked to pre precipitation. Which is something that uh, we discussed in the past several times that we've seen a change in the amount of precipitation that comes down. Maybe not terms not not in terms of net quantity, but in terms of the intensity. We've seen some major changes in uh, when we look at the data that's been recorded for 30 years now. We can actually see some of those changes, and here are the changes. So. When we talk about a major rain event, we're talking about accumulations that is two inches or greater. So if we look at the time frame from 1982 to 1998, in the state of Ohio, we have measured 15 major rain events, which is, again, two inches or greater in one event. But if we look at the years from 1999 to 2015, We've, we see 30. We see double the amount of major intensity rain events. So it's those rain events that really cause problems that when the water doesn't have anywhere to go, where we talk about major erosion problems, when we talk about flooding, that's when we get all those major problems that affect our lives. It's those high intensity rain events. If you were to look at the net rainfall, which I don't have the data in front of me right now, I would think that they would be pretty close. But in terms of those high-intensity events, we see major differences in the way things were in the past versus the way we typically see them now. Right. And we also have the additional impact that has come from the just the simple changing of the landscape. So, you know, this this region was heavily forested and a lot of the trees have been removed. And we all know trees like to drink water and um, evaporate some up the, uh, to the atmosphere. So we've lost that cycling and absorption of water. And a lot of times when we take the trees off and we go back and we pave over the surface. And so we've now taken this area that was once covered in 100 acres of trees and we have uh, taken the trees off, used the timber and then extracted our minerals and then we have built a lovely big parking lot. So we've gone from removing these hundreds of thousands of gallons of water from the soil and putting them back up into the atmosphere and reducing the speed at which that water goes into the water system to collecting it all in a big bowl and shoving it through a little tube directly into the water system. 
That's right. Yeah. Typically around here, we see it go into the Ohio River eventually. From the Ohio River, it likes to join up with the Mississippi and then further on down to the Gulf of Mexico. Right. And so we are in the Mississippi Basin and the Ohio River is a very big river and there's a lot of activity that happens on the Ohio River. But there's also this collection of hills and mountains that feed into it. And so all water rolls downhill and uh, it just depends on which side of the um, mountain chain you're on as to which water basin you're in. So we have the Ohio River Basin and then we have lots of smaller watersheds um, that all feed into themselves and then go into the Ohio River. Like for instance, even just in this area, when you're looking at the northern panhandle of West Virginia, and the surrounding watershed regions. We have the Upper Ohio North, the Upper Ohio South, and the Middle Ohio North. So that's all within like a five-county region going up and down the northern panhandle. And then you go across a lot of West Virginia, you know, we have um, a bunch of other watersheds, but all of these watersheds, except for the ones in the easternmost part of West Virginia, where they're on the other side of the Eastern Continental Divide. Those all feed into the Chesapeake Bay, but pretty much most of West Virginia um, and uh, as all of Ohio, except for maybe the northern parts, I want to say, um, feed into the Mississippi Basin. I think you're probably right. Yeah, the northern, especially the northwestern part of Ohio, all feed into the Great Lakes. From there, I'm not sure exactly how it's separated, but uh, we do have a major... Lake Erie Basin watershed. But around here, we're, yeah, we're not part of that watershed. We're right. part of the Ohio River Mississippi Basin. And so, so what does it matter, right? Okay, yeah, all our water goes to the Gulf. Well, the Gulf is like that magical place that filters out a lot of pollutants, a lot of sediment. There's a delta right at the base of the Mississippi River that grows and changes. And but As that sedimentation gets left in the river system, the soil and uh, debris settles into the base. It makes the river a little shallower, also leads to different ways that the rivers absorb that moisture, right? And so, like, for instance, let's talk about a lot of these uh, Appalachian areas where we have bumpy ground here, right? (laughs) And so you kind of have the choice of building your house on the top of the hill where there's really high wind on the side of the hill where it might slide down to the bottom of the hill, or you can build at the bottom of the hill, which is the floodplain. And the floodplain is typically the flattest region and therefore the most easy to build upon. And so we do have a lot of towns and communities that have developed in these floodplain areas. And it's not just because it was easy to build there, but if you think about the history of our country and the history of most countries, water is where civilization happens because water is great for drinking, it's great for growing crops, and it's great for transportation. And so communities develop around waterways. And you have a lot of communities that are in these flood-prone areas. What can we do to help those communities be better prepared for not the if of a flood, but the when of a flood? You know, it's really easy to say, oh, it's never going to happen to me. But the fact of the matter is, even in Wheeling, you know, this is a floodplain. It's flat here. It's not on the side of a mountain. So therefore, it is a floodplain. Now, it might be a 500-year floodplain. plain. It might be a 1,000-year floodplain. But it's still a floodplain. And so, Everybody should be prepared, even those people that live on the sides of the mountains, because when those streams gather a whole bunch of water from a storm that's much bigger than it normally historically was, it's going to flash flood and you're going to have things ripping out of those gullies. You guys have all heard of a gully washer. They're going to pull all the soil out of those gullies. It's going to flow over the sides. You're going to have flash flooding. So flash flooding is when the creek just can't handle it and it spills over the sides. Yeah, when you're well, when you're talking about where to build your house, I, I don't really see a good choice in all three of them. The top, you're gonna have the winds blow your house down. You said, and then <laughs> the side, you're gonna slip off the side. Which 
you know, one, one thing we're not talking too much about here are slips. So oh, yeah. slips are just a terrible thing. And that's more than just flooding because that will bury things too. Right. And so for those of you who are not in our region, a slip is where the soil can no longer grab on. So much water is collected underneath a layer of the soil and it slides off. So it's like a, a mudslide. Kind of like a mudslide, but it's a little more firm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, exactly. So it's, um, and, and it does a different kind of damage, but still very devastating. Um, so just, and, and it's all, and it all goes back to those major rainfall events that we talked about at the beginning. You know, we see more of those rainfall events. So when Karen was talking about the uh, 500 year floods, the 100 year floods, even the 1000 year floods, with those increase in intensity rain events, those become more and more prevalent. So, you know, we'll have to re examine, you know, how we're going to name those things and how often they occur based on the new normal, right? <laughs> the new normal. <laughs> we say that for a lot of things, but at the turn of the, uh, the century, like in around the 2000s and up, maybe, yeah, that's when we started seeing more of those intense, like those, those high intensity rain events. And it's like every year we see more and more of them. So, you know, we are adjusting to that, that kind of lifestyle anymore. You know, we see like droughts and then all of a sudden a major rain event that either causes flooding, causes, uh, you know, the slips that we were talking about, or even just from a nutrient, uh, what do say, the nutrient flow where we talk about algae blooms and things like that due to excessive nutrient movement from the fields to the water bodies, we're seeing more of that as well. You know, it's all stuff that we have to get more and more used to and uh, we need programs to help manage that water better, um, you know, until things improve as far as we don't see as intensive rain events that cause those floodings and those other problems it's all associated with water. Right. And so uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the things that you can do to help prepare yourself. Um, just little things that you can do around your home, around your farm to make sure that you are prepared for a flood and that you'll be less impacted by the damages that occur. You know, so one of the first things you can do if you are in an area that could experience a flood is to make sure that your home properly drains. So, I'm not talking about the drains um, in your sink or your toilet. I'm talking about the water on the outside of your home. So you want to make sure that the earth around your home has a nice gentle slope away from your home. Gravity is your first line of defense. And so if the soil around your house is tilted towards your house, because let's say you had a sidewalk settle or you removed some shrubs or something, and now the land slopes toward your house, well, that's just going to collect any water because water is going to go to the lowest point and it's going to go right into your basement. So step one is making sure the slope around the base of your home is approximately one to two feet for every hundred foot. So it's not like a mountain going around your house. It's very low, but it is something that'll cause the water to roll away. Um, so that's step one. You don't want to use potting soil or something like this out of your pots um, when you dump in your pots at the end of the year because they're so porous. Uh, it's not going to tamp down well and it's going to absorb water instead of having it roll off. That's right. And as my colleague would say, potting soil is not soil. <laughs> it is a growing <laughs> medium. That's right. It's not clay, sand, or silt. Right. And let's talk about your basement a little bit. For those of you who have basements, um, if your basement is likely to take on water, don't put anything valuable on the floor of your basement. And one of the hardest things of highest value that's on the floor of your basement might be your furnace or your washing machine. Um, I know when we had water a couple couple years back come up into our basement, we lost our washing machine because, of course, they put all those little fancy computer things right down on the bottom. So if you have a newer washer, let's say a front-loading washer, buy the drawer. You know, spend that absorbent three hundred dollars for the drawer to put under your washer because it's going to give you an 
extra foot of space if you get water in your basement for your washing machine to be protected. Yeah, or you could save some money and buy a pallet. Well, you could, but you have to consider the high vibrations that go with a washing machine. Um, And especially if it's off balance or something, you don't want it to fall and break or slide off and maybe hurt somebody. So you do need to make sure that it is sturdy um, and can, can work with the vibrations. That's a good point. That's a good point. Think about those things. Get your furnace should be elevated up off of the ground. Um, Maybe if you are buying a new furnace, have them elevated a little bit more for the next, the new furnace. And just try to make sure that if you have gotten water, you know, how deep has it ever gotten and keep everything above that level and maybe a little bit more. So if you have a refrigerator or freezer or anything like that in your basement, just elevate it up. Now that's also going to help with airflow and um, reduce the ability of mold to take hold. If you are in an area that has flooding, you also don't want anything on the walls of your basement. You want them to be able to breathe. And I know that sounds weird. You're like, they're concrete. They're not going to breathe. They do breathe because they're porous. Um, And so moisture is going to absorb in from the soil around it. And you want it to be able to evaporate out. Remember, the inside of your house is the area of least pressure. And so that's where water wants to go. Um, And sometimes putting a um, protective seal on the inside of your basement walls isn't always the best option because if the pressure on the outside of the wall is so much that and no water can get into your basement to relieve that pressure, the wall itself could crumble. So if you want to seal your basement, talk to a professional that understands how water impacts foundations and make sure that you're not creating a potential um, serious problem for your home on down the road. That's right. So I was just kind of looking at some things here from WVU, actually, Karen. So uh, they have they do have some flood facts and it's stuff that we should know, especially if it's a flash flood, because this is a lot of times when we're going to see these these points and it could save your life if if you follow them. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that floods are among the most frequent and costly natural disasters. So in terms of a natural disaster, chances are flood's going to impact you more so than anything else. So knowing what to do in a flood is very important for your day-to-day life. The force of six inches of swiftly moving water can knock people off their feet. Flash flood waters move at very high speeds and can roll boulders. And trucks. And trucks. Well, what they're saying here is that cars can be moved in two feet of moving water. So when you're dry, when you can't see the road and you're not sure how deep that is, if that water is just two feet and it's moving across the road. Don't drive through that. Yeah. If you see moving water, you shouldn't drive through it because if it's a little bit deeper than you thought, that could easily pick up the car because the car's tires are are full of air Mm -hmm. um, and air floats. (laughs) And and that's exactly what happens. Like it'll just pick up your car and move it. So you can't always tell what two feet is. Yeah. And just six inches of swiftly moving water can really knock you off your feet and move you to who knows where. You could crack your head open, break limbs. Um, it's very scary stuff. So, you know, just don't take those chances if you don't have to. Exactly. Take caution as the number one priority when you're faced with a flash flood event um, where you have that rapid moving water and it's just something that – impacts you out of the blue. I mean, you might not have time to evacuate, but knowing where to chance it and where not to chance it could save your life. Yeah. And you think about your animals too, right? Your animals may be able to swim, but in floodwaters, when they're moving really fast, it's still best to keep them on higher ground. So you think about what is our flooding season? You know, in this area, we typically see more flash floods during the summertime. And so when you look at your rotation on where you're going to, which pastures you're grazing at which times, think about that too, that you don't want to have your animals on the lowest pasture in a time period where we're going to have potential 
potential severe storms that could cause that creek that's nearby to raise up. So try to graze your higher pastures when there's a potential storm event. So even if you're like, okay, well, it's not in my standard rotation plan, but there's a big rainstorm coming and they're predicting floods, I'm going to move my livestock to higher ground. You know, it's it takes time, but if you've got them trained to go through paddock to paddock because you're mob grazing, yay, it's so much easier. But they're still going to follow you. You shake that food bucket. They're going to come. Take them into the next pasture and get them up to higher ground so that you don't have to do it in the pouring rain when you're worried about your house flooding and you're not sure you're going to be able to get back to your house after moving the cattle. Take advanced steps to protect your family and protect your farm. Yeah. And if we, when we were talking about those major rain events that are two inches or greater that we're just seeing more of now than what we used to see in the 90s and the early 2000s, one of the things that you notice is it, it shows you how many per month. And Karen's right. July, August, and September are three intensive rain months. So now is we are kind of in the middle of flooding season, you know, where we see those events where the water can just increase rapidly stream stream like streams can just overflow. And then you have that rapidly moving water that we were talking about that could hurt you in many ways, um, you know, every minor to very, very severe to possibly uh, death. So take precaution and, you know, you know, sometimes, storing hay you have to put it where you have to put it but on the low field next to the creek bank is not a great place to store it not not a great place but i mean if you need a place to feed and that's a paddock well you know but but don't put it all over there right so right yeah don't you know don't put all your eggs in one basket kind of deal right or all your bales in one field right <laughs> so if you don't put all your bales next to the creek um but you can't get a you know let's i'm, I'm not saying don't ever do that because you got to use a field sometime right um but if there is if there is a natural disaster maybe you won't lose everything so Use your best judgment, but um, if you're going to put everything somewhere, put it in higher ground because you you could have a major loss uh, versus a small loss that you can replace. Yeah, and you know one of the things that Dan suggested earlier with a pallet, you know, if you only have low ground, well. Just elevate the hay as much as you can. Get it up off the ground as high as you can to be able to still function with it because, you know, you got to get your equipment in there and everything. That's a good point. You know, just try to elevate it as much as you can. You know, a quarter inch may be enough to save that batch of hay. Yeah, right. Large stone. You know, I've seen people use rails, you know, from like just from railroads. Um, I've got this ancient preparing for flooding booklet here in the office, and I have got some cool instructions on how to build a dike uh, around something you want to protect, you know, how to how to layer your sandbags, how to put plastic over it. So if there is an interest in if you only have low ground and you're like, okay, well, I want to be prepared. Um, how do I build a dike around it? Give me a call at the office and I will send you a copy of this. It's, it's pretty neat and, and not too hard, just time consuming, of course, because everything in agriculture is time consuming. Um, but also before we run out of time, Another thing that you want to make sure you have is a NOAA weather radio. And this is different than getting weather on your phone because sometimes in severe weather events, cell phone towers go down or maybe you don't have a ability to charge your phone. And while they can do a lot of amazing things, a NOAA weather radio uses a simple, uh, um, usually like a nine volt battery and they last forever and they run on radio waves. So they're easy to transport and they get a good signal and they will always have the most up-to-date weather information and evacuation information and things like that. So that is a really important thing to have on hand that a lot of people don't have these days. So go to your local store and look in the electronics department for a NOAA weather radio and um, bring one home with you. Right. That's a wonderful idea because you're absolutely right. Um, cell phones don't always work, especially in, when, well, when towers go down, they won't work at all. And we become so reliant on that. Uh, it's a really good idea to have that means of communication. At least if you're able to get the information to you so you know if help is coming, uh, what to expect, even the all clear sound, you know, to make, to, 
to make sure that uh, everything's okay. So wonderful idea, that NOAA weather radio. And they also uh, work in the haulers. So <laughs> we, even if you have no cell phone signal on a normal day, um, you can still pick up uh, your radio signals on the, NOAA, on the NOAA radio. And, you know, if there is a flood watch or a flood warning and you have power in an area that might be flooded and you can turn off the power to that location, uh, that's excellent because uh, electricity flows very nicely through water and it's very important to reduce that risk. So especially for farm buildings where, you know, maybe your uh, wiring is a little more simple than in a home uh, and you can just flip one switch and turn off the power to that building, that may be a, a really valuable thing for you to do. Also make sure you're tying down anything you don't want to float away, including fuel tanks and equipment. And if you have a well, make sure you are working with your local health department to be sure that your wellhead is above potential floodwaters. If you think your wellhead might be able to be flooded, uh, you'll want to go down and secure it, um, put thick vinyl over it and duct tape it real tight so that water, flood water cannot infiltrate your drinking water supply. That's really crucial, protecting your drinking water supply by having your wellhead high up out of the water or securely sealed uh, during a flood event. Yeah. And we know well, the one thing we didn't talk about that you always see during flood events are sandbags. Um, so mm -hmm. having sandbags in sensitive areas or areas that, you know, right next to the stream going into a paddock, you know, just kind of uh, would be the first place that would flood. You know, that might be a great way to kind of prevent, you know, a, a small flood um, possibly, but, you know, it's, um, it's another precaution you can take. Yeah. And there's also some really neat um, flooding solutions out there if your community is prone to flooding um, that are like they instantly inflate sort of like those boats that you have for uh, airplanes it's like you pull the core that inflates and it seals up against this wall um, and so those are really neat things to look at but you know there is a really great website in addition to WVU Extension's flood webpage it is called ready.gov r-e-a-d-y dot G-O-V. And it gives you a lot of great instructions about how to prepare yourself for a flood, how to stay safe during a flood, and how to recover after a flood, because that's when the real work begins. So the more you do before the flood comes, the less you're going to have to do after the flood, and you'll be able to help your neighbors more. So check out ready.gov. There's a lot of really good information. And make sure that you build your kit, especially if you have life-saving medications that you or a family member take, make sure that you have those in your kit as well as food for, for your pets and a portable shelter for your pets. So if you are evacuated from an area, a lot of shelters will not take a pet unless they are caged. And so that's really important that you have that if you are needing to evacuate with a pet that you can keep them secure. And so do check out uh, ready.gov and make your family's emergency kit to be able to be able to hit the road quick and keep your family safe. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.